I wanted to talk about is the Central House of Artists. It was built by the Artists Union of the USSR. An exhibition area of 9,000 square meters, this gallery, also referred to as the New Tretyakov, has both contemporary exhibitions and historical works, including the famous artist Virishagin. The first exhibition I visited with my godmother was called Da Inoe Jivet Vamnye, which in English means Yes, the other lives in me. It was a collaboration of many artists, not just Russian artists. For example, the famous Marina Abramovich, the Serbian conceptual artist who's known for her body art and the exploration of human limits. On the sign displayed at the entrance, there is an introduction that tells us that we must rethink our role in interspecies communication. With science screaming about climate change, even as we find out about the necessity of doing something, more and more invisible links that hold the wholeness of the ecosystem become destroyed. So how do we form more complicated, meaningful relationships? These artists collaborated with scientists, engineers, specialists in the field of artificial intelligence. It's based on a new stream of contemporary art that people believe to have originated in the 1980s. Here what you see is a work by Orphan Drift, four female artists who founded their group in London, 1994. What If AI was based not on human interpretation, on that of an octopus. This multi-channel video installation is called If AI Were Cephalopod, and there's text, video, images. It runs through many different colors because an octopus shows its mood. It speculates, like, if AI were a cephalopod, its moods would be visible in waves of radiating color. I love the details of this. Another lovely installation was Mirror Ritual. Behind the mirror, artificial intelligence reads the mimicry of her face and reacts with poetry. I did it both times and it gave me grim prophecies, so I guess I'm twice as sad as I thought I was. Roasted by a computer, but at least the tree was nice. There was a communication experiment between the visitors and a black pine tree. You put on the perfume, press the start button, and go talk to a tree. The machine tells you if it has detected your presence, and you can tell it whatever you want. Unusual, but really makes you think. If the tree is listening, what would you say? Obviously, there were a lot more installations, but if you're in Russia, I really recommend visiting it yourself. And if you're abroad, I would watch for it to come to you, but also Google some of the artists. It's honestly fascinating. I'll end with a brief mention of this language that you see here. Finnish artist Sutella using AI to help map the paths of several cells that may potentially live on Mars, and a recreation of what medium Ellen Smith was rumored to say created this Martian language, which is something you just have to be there to hear. I guarantee it sounds like what you think, but also definitely not. 10 out of 10 would recommend the whole exhibition. Now let's talk about the second exhibition that took place in Tadaha, which by the way is the abbreviation for the gallery. As you can see, this is the huge summary of an 800 year period in Russian history. I am definitely Definitely not qualified to recap Russian history at all, and the sad thing is I'll have to do an exam on the 20th century. This exhibition was made for the 800th birthday of Alexander Nevsky, so instead I'll tell you a little bit about him because I do have the skill set to Google. In the end, I'll also expand on a particular painting because it's really famous, hint, it's by Virishagin. In case you're not familiar, he was a famous Russian war artist who painted realism and was known for his works that people thought were unpatriotic because of all the death. Saint Alexander Nevsky played a huge role in battling the Germans and Swedes when they tried to invade Russia. He did kind of help the Mongols though. His actual name was Yaroslavich, but because he defeated the Swedish invasion force at the Neva River, he got the name Nevsky. In Russian, that basically means from the Neva. This ending, ski, is how you usually form names and belongings. Not all cases, but for example, by the same principle, Moskovsky means from Moscow. Alexander became prince in 1236 and the Swedes invaded in 1240, so that's when he got his name. A famous battle was in 1242 
1942, the massacre on ice, Alexander defeated the Germans. He had a difficult journey becoming the Grand Prince, his father was the Grand Prince of Yaroslav, but when he died there was a struggle for the throne between Alexander and his younger brother Andrew. Alexander's father died in 1246. Alexander was made a saint only significantly later after his death by the Russian Orthodox Church because the church supported him since it was doing well under Mongol protection, plus they didn't have to pay taxes. Historians are still arguing whether he was wrong in dealing with Mongol conquerors or whether he planned things in advance. The Mongolian people were a formidable army and Nevsky didn't see the point in throwing away the lives of soldiers and he may also have improved people's lives by collaborating with the Han. People view it like he is a symbol that allowed Russian people to remain Russian and fight against the influence of the West. So that's why he's viewed as a saint, even though you might be surprised that he's treated so well after he didn't do anything to stop the Mongols. Also, all Russian people study him at some point. If you're wondering why I didn't, it's because because I don't go to a Russian school, so if I got something wrong, please tell me in the comments so I can learn. That was Nevsky in a nutshell. Now let's talk about Virushagin's paintings. I think the best way to introduce you to Virushagin is via his most recognized painting, The Apotheosis of War. It actually wasn't in the gallery, unfortunately, but I wanted to talk a little about it here. The idea is that armies from the East make pyramids out of skulls to show their conquest. That's what people thought. Virushagin was very anti-war, so this is another painting highlighting the gravity and the pointlessness of millions of lives being erased. The frame of the painting says to all great conquerors in case you still didn't get the message. Actually, governments were banning their soldiers from visiting the exhibitions. The painting is oil and it was created in 1871. The sun is scorching as you can see by the colors, but it doesn't really matter because the earth is dead anyway, ravaged by the war. The color palette is meant to signify death and emptiness. Something we discussed in school once was actually that if you look, the birds are flying off to the distance to what looks like mountains, but there also could be a town. So these look like carrion birds because they're perched on top of skulls, so it's a feeding day probably, and these birds signify death, so by flying off with a name, it could be a bad omen for the grim future to come. So that's the very happy art of Lady Shagin, the apotheosis of war. Alright, next gallery. I visited Garage once before for an exhibition of Takashi Murakami. I guarantee you've seen his work. It's these rainbow flowers. When we visited this time, there were a lot of ongoing installing projects, so there wasn't actually a lot available to see. But there was an art film showing and the most depressing exhibition of today's video. It was called Museum of Desires and it was all about unrealized projects. Here's what it said on the black. A summary. In the Soviet Union, people considered women's rights to be, well, done, completed, equality. But when Stalin came to power, the gender reform policies were put away. There was a quota for female artists, but none of the women received important state commissions. It was mostly like, just paint pictures of your kids and nature, why aren't you happy? Project Museum of Desires was supposed to be the second issue of the Journal of Feminist Post-Totalitarian Critique Idioma, and it would have brought some new artists onto the scene, but because of no funding, it was never published, just like the Museum of of women's art in Moscow sadly never became a thing. The film showing was Sofia Almeria's b stripe song. It was about colonial erasure and race through performance of monologues, dance, art. You might not be that interested in these subjects, but trust me, you won't be able to look away. The whole time my heart was racing, it was made to be confusing with events seemingly having no order, so it would be a lie to say I understood, but from the music to the framing of the scenes, it was definitely an impactful piece to watch. Almeria talks about allowing mainstream history narratives to lead, instead of what actually 
actually happened. It was filmed in Central St. Martin School of Art and Design, a building that's been empty and at some point the filmmaker mentioned this. In an interview, Sophia also mentions that Eto Adnan's, I believe it's pronounced, 1989 poem The Arab of Apocalypse was a crucial foundation for the movie. In the art gallery for Saturday, we visited Lumiere Hall. There were lithographs of Magritte, and the difference between a lithograph and a print is that in the lithograph the original artworks are used, so before the lit lithographs were made using flat stones and you basically just drew an image onto the printing element using special little crayons. In modern times, the image is made on a polymer coating to a flexible plastic or metal plate. The crayons are made out of compressed crease and, according to Wikipedia, some alkalis such as lye or potassium carbonate. I really liked Reconnaissance Infini, where there was this idea of never knowing everything. Golconad, where it was unclear whether material wealth was lifting the people or they were losing touch with the ground. And of course the famous Le Fils de l'Homme, where the green apple represents temptation. It would have been amazing to see the rich colors in the original though, so if ever the opportunity comes up, I'd love to go. The best moments were the animated paintings. I won't show the whole per performance because then that wouldn't be transformative and would violate the Fair Use Act, but I'll show some of my excerpts. It was really fascinating to watch this and because it was displayed around you, your head kind of spun a little, but you were totally absorbed in the art. Sunday's exhibition contains sensitive content, so I can't put it in the video in case someone will be affected, but what I will do is tell you about Body Worlds. It was an exhibition based on the technique of plastination, where people who donated their bodies to science undergo up to 800 hours of meticulous work, and the result is a model of perfect anatomical structure. In case you're scared, it honestly looks like something fake, it's not really that bloody or anything, and it's just super cool to look at. Plus, things are labeled for people who suck at biology, aka me. Now let's go in a quick walk around Moscow. We took a quick lunch break and then walked down the Red Square. There was some construction going on so I couldn't show the famous St. Basil's Cathedral, but I will show you a little bit of Gum. We wanted to walk a bit and since Gum is a famous crazy expensive tourist destination, we went inside to show what it's like inside the shopping mall. Actually Gum is much more than just a place to shop, it's a really famous and important part of architecture and it's also right in front of London's mausoleum. Gum opened in 1893 and was at the time the largest mall in Europe and also a symbol of new Russia. Inside you can find gastronome number one. You can buy all sorts of food from expensive vodka, mandatory, disclaimer, consumption of alcohol is bad for your health, from vodka to caviar, cakes, anything. During the Soviet Union, the shop was considered the best, not only for the location, but also for the assortment of products it offered. Here you can see something that every Russian person knows, it's called surki, and they come in different flavors. They're supposed to be made out of tvorok, sugar, and other things, but recently there's been a few scandals that people are adding chemicals. Either way, the chocolate ones are the best, I said what I Said. If you follow my Instagram, you should do that by the way. You'll know that I really like The Gentleman in Moscow and the story is set in the Metropole Hotel. Actually, the author Towels visited the hotel, so they introduced a Gentleman in Moscow breakfast, which is based on what Count Rostov had in the book. I didn't actually order, we went in and asked to take a photo of their menu, but they were super nice about it. And now that I've paid homage to that particular book, it's time to stock up at my favorite bookshop, Bookbridge. Whenever I visit Bookbridge, I always get a surprise book in French, and this time I got The Thief of Shadows. At the bottom is a collection of short stories in Russian, then Do Not Say We Have Nothing, it's about life in China under Mao's rule, the book was shortlisted for the Women's Prize in 2017. Then Margaret Atwood's Bodily Harm, about a journalist who flies to a small island in the Caribbean, but things take a turn she didn't expect. After The Handmaid's Tale, super excited for this one. The French book is by Marc Levy, I actually have another one of his works, All the Things We Never Said, and the book at the top as a gift from my dad, it's a thriller about a small town, I love those. I've been wanting to read Baudachi for 
a long time and that's the mini book haul. Look out for my Instagram post. I'll upload some more in-depth reviews when I'm done. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to making more vlogs like this one. So please like and subscribe. <laughs>